tonight's program about the Doty Island Driving Park. I didn't know there was such a thing until uh, I heard about this program. Perhaps you didn't either. The people presenting tonight are Jeff Heimerman. Uh, Jeff grew up on Doty Island in the 60s and 70s, moved away after graduating from Lawrence University. Uh, worked for the EPA with his wife, Sarah. Returned to this area in 2018. I guess the reason he returned is because his wife is from here. <laughs> might have the same experience. Lucky girl. <laughs> Assisting, uh, oh, by the way, Jeff is a member, of, uh, a board member, excuse me, I want to diminish him, uh, of, sure both the, of both the Nina and the Menasha Historical <laughs> Assisting him with his presentation tonight. <laughs> Assisting tonight is Becky Heike Kravitowski. Uh, who is a board member at the Menasha Historical Society. I know you will all enjoy this program. Take it away, guys. Well, thank you very much. And thank you all for coming out in that nasty weather. Hope you can make it home. <laughs> um, I like to have fun when we do these things. So if when it stops being fun, I'm not doing my job. So, all right? There's a lot of interesting things. Um, I want to start off before Becky takes over and just uh, point you to the, the board up here. You'll see a lot of this uh, of my way of marking different newspaper um, uh, articles. It is ABC, Optimum Post Crescent, s and Saturday Evening Press, NBP, Lula Daily Times, NT, Lena Times, MR, Menashe Record, Oshkosh Western and GDPG Green Bay Press Gazette. So that covers most of the articles uh, that I clipped from uh, those on newspapers.com. There's a binder over there that's probably got over 100 articles. Um, this whole venture started in around 1868 before Nina or Menasha was a city and um, a lot of interesting things happened along the way, some good, some bad. So I think at this point I should just... You can just take a seat, Jeff. There I go. <laughs> Once again, it's like having wife. another wife. <laughs> it's really not that bad, I promise, I promise. Um, I just wanted to put, again, welcome everybody, just like Jeff and uh, Jim have to our presentation tonight. Um, I wasn't planning originally on helping Jeff with this presentation, but he's a hard guy to say no to. So I said, okay, I'll give her a come back one more time. I mean, the you guys are going to get sick and tired of listening to me with all these presentations. But it's fun to be able to come back and visit all of my friends, and I'm so glad that you guys are all here tonight. All right. When we, when uh, we first did the very first hidden history of Doty Island way back in 2019. Uh, one of the slides that we talked about was sometimes our community's history is hidden right here in plain sight. Um, back in September was when we did our very first hidden history of Doty Island. Uh, we've taken a look at all different kinds of aspects of the things that were on Doty Island. Everything from the Winnebago Day School, the Whitey Boathouse, trains and depots, uh, the Walter Brothers Brewery, and pretty much anything and everything in between. Um, if you've missed any of those installments, they are available on the YouTube channels. Both Nina Historical Society and the National Historical Society have YouTube channels. Uh, there are different er different uh, videos on each one, so I encourage you to take a look at both of them so you don't miss out on any of the cool things that we've found so far. Um, and then here at the Nina Library, they also have DVD copies of the Hidden History one. So if you're not, don't want to try the internet, don't want to try the YouTube, they actually have the DVD copies as well that you can check out. Um, back in October of 2019, uh, we did Hidden History Part 2, and in that we briefly touched on the Doty Island Driving Park. And uh, Jeff had just started doing some of the research on it, and he was scheduled to present 
And then I guess his son decided to get married and Jane had to take over for him. So this is like Jeff's do-over kind of thing where we get to go a little bit deeper uh, into the driving park and some of the people that are behind. All right. Uh, Jeff and I were at the National Historical Society on Monday and we found this really cool map. Uh, this little treasure is a map of the town of Doty Island, or as it says here in the corner, the plan for the town of Island. Uh, the date on it is 1857. If you look kind of towards the middle here, oh, excuse my map skills, uh, we have the avenue runs across the top, so which we all know as Nicolet or Nicolet Boulevard. Uh, and then we have Menasha to the north, Nina to the south. And one of the cool things about this is it kind of leaves out what, the, uh, what they were kind of thinking about for where we wanted to have different things. You can't really see it very well. And I'm gonna probably keep this up. But there, here they wanted to have a steamboat landing. So if you were coming uh, from the south or north on your steamboat, you could stop here on Doty Island. Uh, they had originally plotted this out to have a railroad depot here, which we know didn't end up there. Uh, there's a lot of other cool little things. This, uh, there's a big hard copy of this map at the Menasha Historical Society. Menasha Historical Society in the Memorial Building. You want to uh, check that out sometime. Um, and then you can also see not a lot of development uh, originally planned for that space. All right, before we kind of get too far in, we want to take a look at what was going on like nationally and here in the Nina Menasha area. Um, the Doty Island Driving Park, as Jeff briefly mentioned, uh, it starts around the 1870s to about the early 1900s. Uh, in that time, we did not have things like the internet. We did not have television. So their forms of entertainment would be uh, when the circus would come to town. There would be vaudeville acts or plays at some of the theaters or any of the larger spaces. And the sports that were popular at the time included things like baseball, basketball, boxing, and horse racing. Um, also at this time, we don't have fancy roads. They're all dirt roads, and of course we don't have cars quite yet. Uh, so we have our horse-based transportation. Uh, towards the end of this period that we're looking at, we're seeing some technological advances that include things like bicycles, electricity, for like residential areas especially, uh, sewer and water, automobiles, and nicely paved streets. Um, for those of you who didn't know, like when it, the very first time I heard of the driving park, wasn't sure what that meant. Uh, basically, it's just a common place where people would go to watch a race of some kind, whether it be horse races, running races, bicycle races, whatever kind of uh, race, and they would be like in a circle or a oval shape. Um, and as Jim and Jeff both mentioned, uh, Nina becomes a city in 1873 and Menasha in 1874. And right as we're starting to thinking about with the driving park, uh, the Nina businessmen originally are involved in things such as flour milling, uh, paper mills are just starting up, you've got the woodenware production in Menasha, uh, with Menasha woodenware, um, and lots and lots of lumbering. Uh, many of these businesses, as they're becoming more successful, the owners are still here in the Nina Menasha area, so they have a little extra money that they want to spend, they want to invest in the area. I'm gonna let Jeff do this slide. Oh. Right. Yeah. You have your notes up here, come here. Oh, right, thanks. So, the driving park uh, was located in the most northeasterly section of Nina that you could possibly be on. And, uh, and if you look, uh, this is a 1938 aerial, uh, first one of its kind. And you could actually see
see the oval racetrack right there. I don't know if you can follow my finger. But that's, that's where um, almost all the action that we're talking about uh, took place. And to this day, it's really not all that built up at all. And I'll get to, uh, we'll get to that at the end. Uh, so, at any rate, probably should have read what I'm supposed to say. Um, so the land speculators such as uh, a guy coming up, Benjamin Franklin Moore of Bonlac, James Doty, Wayne Doty, and Charlie Charles Doty owned large swaths of this land. But I always wondered in this research that I've been doing is how a guy from Bonlac even knew that this was there, much less own the land. And so he's coming up uh, prominently throughout the early part of this. All right, um, here he is. This is Benjamin Franklin Moore of Fond du Lac. Um, in 1868, before Menasha becomes a, incorporated as a city, there's a bunch of Menasha men who formed this, what was known as the Menasha Driving Park Association. Um, and in the news article that's way over there, you can see some of their, uh, the names of the individuals who were on this list. Uh, the purpose of this association was to purchase 61 acres of undeveloped land that Benjamin Franklin Moore owned. Um, if you look closely at some of the names on here, uh, Jeff, you're gonna have to help me with some of the bananas. So, there, so if you count them out, there are about 49 uh, different people uh, contributing from the richest guys, $600, and from the lower guys, 50 bucks. But um, this was the, and a lot of other things were going on at this time too, including the building of the National Hotel in Menasha and the uh, railroad system from the Wisconsin Central Railroad. And by publishing this article, they're trying to encourage their friends and neighbors, hey, we think this race, horse racing park is a great idea. We hear about it in the newspaper from, you know, places all around town, and we want to have one here so we don't have to travel to, like, Green Bay or Appleton or any place like that. Um, and as Jeff said, the village of Menasha, at the same time they're trying to build this driving park, they're also interested in getting a hotel. Uh, and to get the railroad in there. So there's a lot of different things that the uh, men of Menasha are interested in uh, trying to get set up and established to make their city a great place to live. Uh, and as Jeff said, we had the question, well, how in the world did some guy from Fond du Lac come to know about Menasha? Because there's, you know, there's no TV. There's no, uh, nothing really going on. Um, so when we were researching, we came about the answer by taking a look at the history of Winnebago County. And in this book, uh, Frank Morris, he's known, uh, as opposed to Benjamin Franklin Morris, um, he's an owner of this steamboat that's called the Paytona. Uh, the steamboat makes daily trips between Fond du Lac and Menasha, and many times as the owner, Frank decides, hey, I'm gonna go take a trip and go visit and see what's going on. And then he also, as long as he's up, you know, uh, seeing what's up in Menasha, he's also talking to the individuals there, getting to know some other guys. Um, and then he starts hearing about, oh, this really nice land that's available. Uh, Benjamin Franklin Moore is a, uh, a lumberman and a landowner himself in Fond du Lac, and he thinks, ooh, there's all this great land in Menasha, this is something I wanna get a part of. Um, and when we were looking at photos and paintings, we came across this one. And for those of you who are a little familiar with the history of Menasha, uh, this is a, a painting that depicts uh, when Elisha D. Smith and his wife, Julia, are coming to Menasha for the very first time, and they're on this little sailboat here. And they are the, who become the founders, or not the founders, they're the ones that really started investing in uh, the Menasha wooden wear company. So this is depicting their trip, the end of their trip from out east in Rhode Island to settle in Menasha. And the interesting part about this is the boat that you see back here in the background, this is the Paytona, owned by Benjamin Franklin Moore. We 
have a representation of both Mr. Smith and uh, Benjamin Franklin Moore. And I think we debated whether that is the council tree or an image. <laughs> right, the one that's over on this side. Maybe, maybe not, maybe a little bit of artistic. The list on the other slide, uh, they talk about some of the prominent businessmen of Menasha. Uh, Jeff went ahead and found a whole bunch of photos of some of these guys. Uh, some of them we've done uh, some cemetery walk uh, information on, a couple of them. So the um, top row, left hand side, a guy named uh, E.L. Matheson, was a big deal back in point, right? And then we've got Curtis Reed, uh, O.J. Hall, which is the first mayor of Menasha, and that's uh, Henry Hewitt Sr. and a young Elijah E. Smith. And then, so along the bottom there, named uh, J.F. Jocelyn, Abel Kies, Henry Hewitt Jr., R.M. Scott, speaking of the National Hotel, he was one of the guys who put up all the money for it, and uh, S.S. Roby, who was a guy who seemed to have a lot of meetings at his place. But it was really, you know, it's getting these, this, you know, getting pictures of, of people is so hard in this business of, of going back into history. So. Especially with, in the early early 1900s, late 1800s. So to have this many of them, I thought was uh, pretty impressive. Uh, this short little article talks about uh, the newspaper editor at the time is trying to drum up support from their readers. Uh, they're saying that in the article, the positive aspects of the driving park getting established at Doty Island, they'll make uh, the cities are up and coming, and they, you know they'll be able to support the driving park and some of the other adventures. And it's really something that you know the citizens really need to get behind. Uh, these two articles talk about a general push by the people in both Nina and Manasha to buy those 60 acres of land and make sure we get this deal done. Uh, the 68 attack by the shoreline of Lake Winnebago, like we saw in the maps. Uh, originally, the article suggested that Nina and Menasha band together to buy the land for the park, uh, and then the grounds could be used for any outdoor large uh, engagements or activities. Um, it ends by saying that the article was typeset by before the last. We have learned from the uh, original article, the Menasha citizens were the ones who subscribed to the stock originally uh, for the for this first uh, go around to do the purchase. And the Menasha driving park happened to be in Nina. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jeff decided also to take a look at uh, to go visit the Register of Deeds in Oshkosh. Uh, because you know, looking at old newspapers wasn't fun enough, he decided to take a look at some uh, other legal documents. And uh, for those of you who don't know, before working with historical uh, things, I was a bank auditor for like 10 or 11 years. So when he brought me something that said like warranty deed and mortgage, I was like, oh, yeah, I know what these things are. Thank God. <laughs> And I could read through them and understand what was all going on in these art, in these uh, documents. Um, so what we found, or what Jeff found and I helped him interpret, uh, were a couple of documents. The first one we found was the warranty deed, which is a, a big fancy uh, way of saying uh, in the old days we didn't have a title company to do the search on our tracks to make sure we were the sole owner. So we had, as the owner, we had to, we had to attest to anybody buying and say, yes, I am the only owner I own this free and clear, and that was the first uh, document that we found. So the Benjamin Franklin Moore and William Conklin owned the 60 acre tract, and then they signed this warranty deed to the Menasha Driving Park Association saying, yep, we own this free and clear, and we're gonna like, sell this to you guys. Uh, and then Menasha Driving Park goes ahead and uh, does a mortgage back to uh, William Conklin and Benjamin Franklin Moore in September of 1868 for a whopping $6,318 for 60 acres. They had to pay it back within five years, 
with the nice interest rate of 10%. Uh, at the time, the mortgage was signed by Curtis Reed and Edward Matthewson as the president and I believe the secretary. Uh, what? The only, the only thing uh, that I was going to interject here is that ultimately it was turned out to be 20 acres of land that was purchased. Uh, and the rest was probably the places where uh, Gilbert Jones and um, uh, the guy from, from Kimberly Clark, come on and help me here. Uh, Mom, thank you. Uh, that that area of the park, which was not a part of this, this piece. All right. So in 1870, uh, in addition to the driving park, uh, we also are taking a look at the National Hotel. Uh, the the uh, one of the selling points for coming to visit the National Hotel is that they have water that is pure, the site is healthy, the driving park has been secure, so everybody should come up and visit in uh, Nina and in Asha out on beautiful Jody Island. Um, these couple of articles are talking about, uh, this is trying to encourage the citizens, like, hey, if we get these parks done, make sure that you actually go and visit what's going on uh, to make sure that the parks are successful. We don't want to just buy, set up everything, and have nobody come and visit. Um, the, they're also talking about if they have the driving park and this other outdoor spaces that they uh, can hold some other exhibits, uh, including the first exhibition of the Fox Valley Agricultural and Mechanical Association. Um, and it just talks about that Dodie Island is a delightful spot to visit. Um, so Menasha Driving Park comes ahead and uh, they have the stock that we had the original owners, um, but they didn't sell enough of the stock to meet the state requirements. Uh, because the businessmen in Menasha were trying to do the National Hotel, they're trying to do the railroad, they didn't quite have enough people to uh, get enough of the stock sold. So uh, the Menasha Driving Park is in a little bit of trouble at this point. Uh, then we find this little article, which is a request for a sheriff sale, which usually indicates, uh-oh, somebody didn't pay their mortgage. Uh, the the sheriff sale is brought about by a woman called whose name is Julia Brand, uh, also from Fond du Lac. Uh, she probably heard about this wonderful land on Dodie Island from her friend Benjamin Franklin Moore, and is like, hey, if they're not paying their uh, mortgage and everything, uh, we want to see if we can get this land. Uh, William, her husband, William Brand. Is Julia Brandt's husband. He was also a lumberman, just like Benjamin Franklin Moore was, also a land speculator at the time. Um, but it, he had passed away by this time, and Julia was all was very much interested in all the uh, land that was around, and she wanted to buy some more. So she's saying, you know, sheriff, you know, let's go ahead and get this auction of the land that isn't being paid on, um, and then they take it to a sheriff. And that all happened at the National Hotel. <laughs> um, and then as a result of the sale, Benjamin Franklin Moore owns the property back again. Because he likes it so much. So now he has, Benjamin Franklin Moore now has those 60 acres on Dode Island back again. He's still in Fond du Lac, but he's still thinking, uh, still get something good for this. Um, and then there's businessmen in Nina Menasha that are still are thinking, we still want this driving park. This is still a good idea. You know, we're getting the, our businesses are becoming more successful. We still want to have this driving park. And then the good thing is the railroads are done. The National Hotel is now done and, and people are coming to visit. So now we have a little bit of extra money. So now we come back to this photo or painting, I'm sorry. Uh, the painting is just a depiction of what the new driving park looks like. Um, in this photo, 
or painting, I'm sorry, is in the Menasha Public Library. And I'm gonna give this back to Jeff. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So this, this painting was a gentleman named uh, Chaz Byer. Uh, I think he was up in Nina, I'm not 100% not positive, but somewhere on the island. And uh, I think this is uh, one of a series of memory sketches that he did. Uh, and those are all in the, uh, the National Library. I guess, huh? Sorry. No, no, no. So, uh, what ended up happening really, as you see, and we've got nothing but articles here, so hopefully it's not boring you to, to, uh, to tell them back. Uh, Benjamin Moore came to town and allowed the Driving Park Association to buy the east 20 acres of his 60 acre track. Uh, a new stock company was created the organization perfected. It adopted the name of the Doty Island Park Association. The officers were President C.F. Felton, Vice President F.C. Shattuck, these are familiar Nina names, A, I always like the ones with three digits, A.H.F. Kruger, otherwise Fred Kruger, or Frank Kruger, F.C. Shattuck, uh, George, uh, Dodge and Miles Wheeler and John Roberts and John Roberts uh, I know well from uh, uh, doing research and a presentation on the um, Roberts Resort so that's what was going on so here we go so the surveyor Palmer of Oshkosh laid out the track yesterday it will be ready for the fall races Soon it will be enclosed by a high board fence and the track will be graded to first class style. Also that summer, the avenue was constructed east to west, dividing Doty Island into the villages of Nina and Menasha. The driving park is accessed by the avenue. So again, the further most north new officers were elected uh, for the ensuing season and we're going back and it's uh, P.P. Lawson is now president, vice president, Miles Wheeler, Kruger, uh, the board of directors, Alex McGinty, and a few others uh, were a part of that. Nina and Manash. I think the whole reason this started to um, work was because Nina and Manash gentlemen came together as a team. So, Mr. Page of Oshkosh was on the ground with his horse, Akbar. O.W. Clark of Appleton owns Longfellow. From the few articles available, it seems that Mr. Clark, Longfellow, and Mr. Page of Oshkosh, Akbar, will see the trot well into the future. George Morris, the horse trainer of Doty Island, is now open in his boarding stable. June 16th of 1881, the seventh Day Adventists take over the driving park for the week. And there was a couple of those that happened over time. They erected a two center pole canvas tent surrounded by smaller sleeping tents for the families. I think you saw some of those smaller sleeping tents that were uh, up in the, the, the slideshow. Regina. Ah. So once you get into the 1880s, hanging on by a string, I think. Um, this guy, Seth A. Bow, was a, a veterinary surgeon, plans to open the track for the fall races. And I think depending on what part of the season it is, that affects uh, people's decisions as well. So some people like the fall season better than the summer seasons uh, for, for uh, working the park. Uh, at, at any rate, uh, Seth Bow is also he was a, a sharpshooter for the, or later known as the Illinois 66th Volunteer Infantry for the Civil War. But I thought that was pretty cool. He is on the left up here, and this is his brother, Prospero. The 
crowd was large this PM, the horses entered into the three minute race where Bismarck Chief, Lady Fenton, Fred A, and Kitty A. In the free for all, Princeton Boy, Little Mac, Colonel Cloud, and Oshkosh entered. Princeton Boy won the, won the first heat. I'm not really including many, any of the races, hardly any of the races. Uh, so it was just, now I think about 1883, distant, you know, troubling waters ahead. Um, you know, Seth Bo is trying to make this all work. He's got, he's giving people lessons themselves. He's got horses that he's training. And, uh, you know, you know if, it, if you can get the subscription paper to secure funds sufficient to pay the uh, expenses there, um, uh, that's what, what he was facing. The same as being liberally signed by our citizens. The park should be open for a few, a finer piece of, or a drive on the evening is not to be found in Wisconsin. It is hoped that Professor Bowe will secure sufficient funds to open and keep the track up in, the, in repair. You know, so again, we're just on to more problems. So, you know, Professor Seth Bow is making arrangements to open the driving park for this coming summer, which would be uh, 1883, and is circulating a subscription paper to secure funds sufficient to pay the expenses are out. I guess I'll run ahead of me. Um, promptly within a few days and buy their season tickets so to raise the amount of money that is necessary to keep the track safe. And he goes on a little later, I shall not open the track as the rent has to be paid before anything can be done on the track. No one will be allowed to drive without a ticket, which will admit yourself and your family at all times. Seth Bowe says, I can be found at the Union House. I guess that's downtown Union, yeah, that's right on the corner of Commercial in Wisconsin. Where'd these guys all come from? Man? Oh, now we start getting into the era of entertainment. Uh, so in 1883, there was a, a race that was going to be done for uh, two female uh, horseback riders. Um, I think they're distance riders, Mrs. Wall and Mrs. Tennyson. The novelty of a 10 mile race between Mrs. Wall of Michigan and Miss Tennyson. These are the ladies who raced at the fair <coughs> at Oshkosh a week from, uh, or will at a week from next Wednesday. And then we have the one tragedy that, that came about. A guy named William Bailey, who lived in the fourth ward of Nina, um, worked uh, with P.B. Lawson in the barns. Um, William, uh, whose fall from the loft of the driving park barn last August, was noted in the Nina Times died yesterday from the effects thereof. His skull was fractured by the accident. His funeral will be held tomorrow. His age was 50 years old and he leaves a wife and five children. The funeral is from his, the home of his brother, Jerome. Moving on into the, the, the mid 1880s. Uh, uh, if tomorrow, is dry and fine, the track on the driving park will be in good condition for the races. The largest crowd of people who ever attended the races at the driving park were on the grounds yesterday afternoon. And a greeting from an old friend from Menasha, Mr. C.S. Felton, one of the boys on the road representing Chicago, a Chicago clothing house. Baseball comes to the driving park, 1885, another sort of exhibition. This time it was the Young Ladies Baseball Club. Bells of the Bat and Daisies of the Diamond. <laughs> <laughs> Women's, they took on uh, the um, any, uh, nine, nine men of, of, from Anita's club. I don't think they were 
It was just nine men coming together for that. So they're reaching out for other kinds of entertainment. Yeah. Several baseball games take place between the, the Ninas and the Menashes. Horse races start to become less frequent. Managers of the driving park invite all to use the driving park at any time without charge. And so this is 1895. Trotting and pacing races, races at the driving park on the other. I don't have any notes in this. Oh yeah, several several of the uh, um, men who ended up having this. So William Stridey was a farmer down in that area. He owned the land for a year, followed by John Strange, who wanted to put his straw for his factory on in that in that area. Uh, another Nina. Entrepreneur, he, he ended up buying it for a year and using it. And he wanted to, uh, um, what was it again? Yo, no, he wanted, all oh, right. He wanted to, um, to find, find a sale to the Chautauqua Assembly. And if that stock comes in, capital is raised in Athens, it means the purchase of the Peabody Park Plaza. Anyway, finally came to Charles R. Smith, who we now all know as uh, one of the sons of Elijah D. Smith, and notably, probably the richest man in Wisconsin in, in that time period. And I think in his will, or his estate was valued somewhere between two I think it was two million and eight million dollars in, in what was nineteen sixty is when he actually died. Um, we're almost done. So that's what I was looking for before. <laughs> Forgot to mention that that uh, that as somebody else uh, I think Becky did earlier. Um, People wanted foot races as well. So Lawrence University, and I know the Nanina and the Menasha high schools would run foot races at this driving park. And, uh, and I have more of the one to two week camp meetings like the Seventh Day Adventists um, use the land by permission. I know that at least uh, Charles Smith allowed that to happen. And again, uh, Sam Cook wanted to make it a Chautauqua, Chautauqua uh, assembly meeting place. This is the reason why the Doty Driving Park ended. <laughs> Charles R. Smith uh, bought the land in 1900. Charles R. Smith died in 1960. Maury Smith, Sr., not the guy in the back of the room. <laughs> Um, he married Catherine Lawton Ives Smith of Savannah, Georgia, and moved into this brand new house in 1917. They lived there until they died. Uh, Maury in 1964 and Catherine in 1967. This was right on the water. And it was like the only house along the water, except for one that I'll mention later, and I'll point to this. Anyway, this is, um, uh, you might be able to tell, but this this is the backyard, and because the, uh, the um, whatever they're called again, <laughs> it's just the shades, you know, so that they, they well, on and thank you, and she's out there. Um, so yes, they, they lived there until they died, uh, Maureen in 64 and, and Catherine in 67, enjoying the solitude with no other house on the old driving park property. So, hope you enjoyed the evening.